So, good evening, and I'm going to be talking about chronic pain today, which is a very personal story for myself. Uh, but I'm also going to be talking about coming out of your comfort zone and trying new things. And this week has been a banner week for me. Uh, first, I took part in a Pika Kucha, I think that's how you pronounce it, event at Engine, uh, which is 20 slides, 20 seconds each. And I kind of ran over on those. The problem was I didn't have control. I didn't advance my slides on my own. I'm not used to that. Uh, so this event I'm looking forward to because I've got control now. And this relates to <laughs> chronic pain because a lot of times chronic pain patients feel like they've lost control of their lives and of the pain itself that's taken over their, their bodies. And that loss of control is something that we can do something about. We can put some of it back into their hands, uh, whether it's a patient-controlled analgesia or a physician or another healthcare professional helping and listening and trying to make them part of the plan. Uh, so I, I choose the song, Lighting the Song with Sense and Color. It's from Terrapin Station, the Grateful Dead song. And uh, it's going to be this academic perspective of chronic pain and what we can do about it. Uh, I'll present it as a burden to society and a burden to the individual. Uh, but I'm not going to hold you know, just despair. I'm going to uh, try to inspire us to do something about it. So if you've you know, been reading the newspapers and you look at Time magazine or any other you know, periodicals, pain and opioids are you know, big concerns to the nation. Uh, and it, it has come to dominate a lot of our healthcare system. If you look at the numbers, roughly a third of Americans meet the diagnostic criteria for chronic pain each year, 100 million people. You start to think about you know, how that permeates the healthcare system. And the problem is we're not adequately treating it. We have drugs that you know, may be good for acute pain, but they're not so good for chronic pain. And so the patients have incomplete efficacy when they take these drugs, and they have many terrible side effects. And then we have you know, confusion with the opioids, which have addiction potential and diversion. People will sell them, people will take them as if they're candy, and this then you know, gets dumped onto the street and creates even greater problems. The economic impact is something we need to think about too. So it's been estimated that direct and indirect costs of chronic pain in the United States annually are on the order of 500 to 600 billion dollars. Think what we could be doing with five to 600 billion dollars each year could probably send all of you to school for free. That would be kind of nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> so this is a very personal story, too, for me, because I have two parents who suffer from chronic pain. It's my mom and my son, or you know, yeah, so his, her grandson. And uh, you know, the, the quality of life that she has enjoyed over the last 30 years has been compromised by chronic pain. At times, it's a result of a broken hip. And at times, she has felt very isolated. She has despaired. She's become depressed. She's become anxious. She doesn't sleep, she doesn't walk, she doesn't exercise. There's a lot of things that she'd like to do and she can't because of chronic pain. And a lot of that problem was related to physicians not listening to her. She ultimately got some relief and got a surgeon who listened to or believed what she was telling, even though the MRIs and the x-rays and the CT scans were all showing nothing was wrong. There was something very wrong with her hip as it was degenerating. So she's a success story in some respects uh, with conquering chronic pain. This is my dad, who was otherwise healthy into his late 70s, early 80s, and then started to develop chronic pain. And they didn't know what it was. Uh, it was in his back. They thought you know, maybe it was a herniated disc, maybe it was stenosis of the spine. Uh, and I could see it firsthand watching his, uh, his manner and how he walked around, how he moved, how he stood up. He couldn't stand, he was hunched now. He wasn't working out as much. Uh, and he was wincing in pain. This is him taking the laundry out. Now, this is down in the basement of our house, and it's a two-story house. They've had to install one of those uh, stairs uh, that, that goes up with them, uh, and they love it, and they use it for themselves now, and they use it for the laundry as well. But it definitely, pain is impacting his life, and he's being bounced around from healthcare professional to healthcare professional, trying to figure out what is the source of his pain. He's gone through some pretty uh, rigorous treatments, injections, ablations of nerves, and it still hasn't solved the problem. Now they're looking at the sacroiliac joint, as another possible source for this abnormal pain and the referred pain from one part of the body to another part. Uh, so that's him kind of wincing in pain. I didn't get some of the other pictures that really show him grimacing uh, when he's doing this. So if you think about it, me as an outsider, even though it's my own dad, looking outside in, not seeing the whole picture, because you've got a window, a barrier, to really what is confronting a chronic pain patient. So if you look a little bit closer, you start to see that each of these people that suffer from chronic pain have kids, grandkids, 
they have things that used to be high quality of life. And that's been compromised because of the chronic pain. And you can understand the despair. I like these two uh, pictures. Uh, I don't know how many of you recognize the person on the right uh, as Bob Dylan. Uh, you know, as I get older and older, less and less of my students recognize who he is. And when he was writing the song Tangled Up in Blue, he was uh, studying the Cubist movement. And Pablo Picasso was one of the artists that kind of revolutionized that movement in the early 1900s. It's kind of fascinating that uh, his quote, we always did feel the same, we just saw it from a different point of view, relates to this Cubist movement. They were, at the turn of the century, in the early 1900s, confronting a society that was radically different than the century before, with technology, with industrialization, and globalization. And there was a lot of despair and anxiety, too. Think about the start, or the lead up to World War I, and the lead up to World War II, and how people had to start to think about a very complex life, and understand other nations and their perspectives. This relates to some of the talks we've only already heard about. So I'm going to make the same case that chronic pain requires different perspectives and different health professions to work together for the best outcomes for the patient. To do that, we need a team. No one individual or one healthcare practitioner is going to be able to solve this chronic pain problem. And it really can be you know, overwhelming. Why even start? Why bother? 100 million US people suffer from chronic pain. We don't understand it fundamentally. Uh, from a biological standpoint, how are we going to solve this? Well, you form teams, and I've been lucky to be part of a great team that's forming here at the University of New England. And we're not just biologists or chemists or physicists. We're philosophers like David Smith. We're artists like Sarah Gorham. We're healthcare practitioners, social workers, OTs, PTs, osteopathic physicians, nurses, et cetera, et cetera. And we're coming together around causes. We are fascinated by the human nervous system and its complexities. And it's very fortunate that you know, the United States is heading into another renaissance for neuroscience now. Huge initiatives to look at how we are fundamentally wired and how this nervous system works. It's going to take many decades to figure all this out. But the promise is that if we do understand these biological systems, we can develop better treatments for chronic pain. But even with all that high tech, we do have some great new tools. Very interested in this one form of spectroscopy that can look at the chemicals inside our synapses and regions of brain matter as they change in real time in an awake, alive human being. That is incredible to think that we have that power now. But now we have to ask interesting questions and design those experiments that are going to give us those key insights. The genetics revolution and pharmacogenetics and tailoring therapies for individuals, that's all great as are the traditional biomarkers, listening to the patient, taking their patient history, and understanding how they fit into you know, a social setting, a family structure, or a society. Those are all going to have to be combined and integrated to come up with a plan. We're taking different perspectives at UNE. I think this is one of the things that's most exciting, is that how do you portray the chronic pain problem? You have to do it in many different ways, including the visual arts. This is uh, inspired by a lady who had, had multiple surgeries of her spine. Something went wrong with one of those surgeries. Some nerves were nicked, damaged. Now her body, her back, feels like there's a blowtorch on it almost all the time. Think about living through that. She escapes it momentarily when she paints. The pain is not as much of a distractor. Her painting uh, and the art of painting is, is more consuming at those moments. But she can't obviously do that all the time but it can kind of tell you what it must feel like to be trapped in one of these bodies where the nervous system is dysfunctional and leading to these abnormal pain syndromes. Here's another lady from Texas who came out to uh, visit us and talk to our students about her chronic back pain. You can see the, the, the mixing of reds and blues, the hots and colds, the electrical stabbing-like properties of this chronic pain that she endures every day of her life. So we need to think also about the comorbidities. Like I mentioned, my mom became depressed, anxious, isolated. We all experience these things, but imagine them being extreme and all-consuming, along with the chronic pain, and feeling hopeless. So you can imagine that uh, suicide is one of much higher incidence of suicide in people who have, uh, suffer from chronic pain. So we can't just attack the pain problem. We need to think about all of these other things as well. Now, we've got to have balance, though. 
because even if we could provide the greatest treatments possible, but it costs too much to deliver, would society or would the individual be able to afford it? So that's this balance of scale of the patient and the societal unmet needs that we're trying to solve with medicine and, and promote health versus what can we afford and how can we find those good balance zones. Unfortunately, we're not in balance with our prescriptions. And these things come in cycles. If you're old enough to remember Valium in the 1970s, or Prozac, fluoxetine, an antidepressant in the 80s and 90s. Maybe it was the cyclooxygenase inhibitors, the celecoxibs and rofecoxibs, Vioxx. Now it's the opioids. And you know, think about it. The number one prescription drug in the United States is hydrocodone. 130 million prescriptions filled every year in the United States. Multiply that by the average number of pills per prescription, maybe 30 or 40 pills per prescription. Do the math, and it is staggering. We have saturated society with these pills. There is evidence coming out, so I'm going to be one of the few that's going to show some graphs. The bottom line in these graphs is saying that we took Vioxx off the market because it increased the chance of heart attack and stroke. Yet look at the opioids in the red line. That's well above the Vioxx-type drugs in terms of cardiovascular risk events and fractures. Now, these are retrospective data, and they have limitations. But they are areas of concern, at least in this study that looked at older adults with non-malignant chronic pain taking these opioids. It's just the tip of the iceberg, and we're going to need to learn more about this. Look at the number of prescriptions in kilogram quantities. We take drugs in milligram quantities. This is in kilogram quantities for 10,000 people. Maine is one of the leading states. So there's opioids all over Maine. As the number of opioids being prescribed has increased, you've also seen a concomitant increase in the level of deaths due to opioid overdoses, either alone or in combination, or people being hospitalized because of overdoses. These are problems that cost society Pharmaceutical deaths, looking at single sources of prescription drugs that affect the central nervous system. Opioids are far and away the number one. And this is only by themselves. In combination, it's even that much more. So I said, you know, despair can set in. How are we going to solve this problem? Congress uh, commissioned the Institute of Medicine and a Blue Ribbon Commission to look at this. And they, their book, which is freely available on the internet for download, is Relieving Pain in America. I'm just going to quickly touch on some of the blueprint. Set goals that are relevant and meaningful to the patient and the society that they live in. Invest in research, whether it's basic science and clinical. Better educate healthcare professionals. That's something as a university we can absolutely do. And deliver pain care in more coordinated and effective fashion. So the first part is looking at quality of life measures. And it's not just the physical. It's the emotional and the social. If you don't have that broad support, you don't have that foundation, if it's not integrated, it's not going to be as stable. It's not as going to be as satisfying a solution. Here's another graph. The bottom line here is we're not funding pain adequately. The economic burden outstrips the combination of cancer, cardiovascular, and diabetes. Yet if you look at the amount of pain studies being conducted and the amount of money devoted by the National Institutes of Health, towards solving this chronic pain epidemic, it dwarfs in comparison to these other diseases. We've got to have a better alignment in terms of the burden and the amount of resources that we put to solve the problem. Here's the medical education. And you know it's kind of uh, sobering to think that uh, four years of medical school, the average number of lecture hours devoted to pain is about 10 or 11. Luckily, here at the University of New England, all of our health professionals get a lot more than that and it's integrated through an interprofessional collaborative. So I was fortunate to be part of a team that brought together a thousand of our students in the Alphonse Forum to look from a holistic, integrative approach, chronic pain. And we were fortunate to bring experts that were heading some of the NIH initiatives, some people who are reforming medical education, health professional education, and people who are dealing with end-of-life care. The other thing that was outstanding was we brought in some patients. And this is where I stepped out of my comfort zone. I got introduced to Paula and many other people because of a big grant that we got and a press release that we put out. This is the original email from her mom. And she's, it was a very long email. 
She wanted to enroll in clinical trials. She's desperate for her daughter to get better. Her daughter twisted her ankle when she was 13, and the pain didn't go away. It got worse and worse and worse, developed into something we know as complex regional pain syndrome. This is her foot. This is the bathroom. She's got an open sores that bleed all the time on top of absolutely horrific pain. Her doctor that initially saw her didn't believe her. He told her, you're 13, suck it up. The next uh, physician that she was bounced around to didn't believe in newfangled diagnoses, dismissed it, it's all in your head. And then, to put it in perspective, when we talk about things like allodynia to medical students, I can describe a sunburn. Think about going up or down an elevator and that little pressure change you might detect in your ear. That is causing excruciating pain in her leg. She made the trek all the way out here to UNE to speak to our students. Pain affects little kids. This boy has rheumatoid arthritis. Holly Haywood and others took these pictures and got their narrative. A Navy SEAL, Rob Foley, tough as nails. He's got PTSD with chronic pain. They co-vary quite a bit. And if one gets under control, the other one flares up, then they're both back. And he's using something besides pills. He refuses to take them. He exercises, and he does equine therapy. When he's with horses, it relaxes him. Sue uh, is someone else who suffers from rheumatoid arthritis. It took years to get the correct diagnosis. The, she thought she was dying of bone cancer. She started to describe how it enveloped her life. It was a fog, clouded her. She talks in her narrative about this inspiring homeless man that looked her straight in the eye and said, I see your pain. I hope you feel better. I hope you get better soon. She formed a chronic pain support group after that encounter because she knew she had to do something. You and E were doing things in the K through 12 outreach program. So one of the things that I get to do tomorrow is go down to Washington, D.C. And I get to join Mike Berman and some of our outreach team with a special event at the, uh, sponsored by the White House to talk about our program and how it's changing lives around brain safety and understanding the nervous system. I'll leave with a couple inspiring quotes and things that I've learned. Jackie Robinson, do things that are meaningful to you, that you're passionate about, and work as a team to solve those problems. This is a uh, rabbi who took on the Talmud to translate it and, and provide some commentary. It took most of his adult life. He would never have done it if he had realized how much work was involved at the beginning. So my final slide, this is my son's footsteps. After the bus stop, I was walking back. The sun was glinting on a beautiful fall morning. And I thought for a minute, geez, why didn't I think of that? I took the damn walkway. I took a right angle. It took me a lot more time, and it was a lot less fun. He jumped over a bush, went hither, there, and there. You see the variation. He got to the same point. He got there quicker, and he had a lot more fun with it. So take that child's perspective on life. Don't be afraid to go off-road at times. Bend some rules. We're doing that at UNE, and have fun doing it. Thank you.